Kalimera, Kalispera, whatever time you are watching, this is Mapa. Before we start, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, follow our Facebook group page, Discord. We've got everything. We're, we're in 2023 now. We, we are modern. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still, and my co-host is a gentleman that has been in Cyprus a couple years. He knows the yeah. island very, very well. Arnau Alcovero. Have I pronounced it? Correct. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> Beautiful. Because my, my co-host, Thasso, who usually jumps on this pod, he always criticizes me for my pronunciation of French names. And you're not French, which yeah. is okay, so I, I get away with it. Because he lives yeah, in France. Cool. He's a little bit of a, you know, you know yeah. merci, all that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> you know, whatever. But, uh, mate, thank you for joining me. Really appreciate it. I know um, you've been, you're a busy guy. You've got a lot going on in your life, so I appreciate your time. Let's thank you, start... Guys. No, it's an absolute pleasure. Now, I know you started your career in football as a, I believe, a coach back in 2016. Is that correct? Yeah, more or less. Yeah, as a as a head coach. A head coach around yeah. to to 16 to 15. Yeah. Okay, and that was at a club in Catalonia. Is that correct? Yes, it's where I'm from originally. I started with a second division in Catalonia team. Luckily, we got promoted and became champions of Catalonia in the first year. So. Not bad for a first start. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So yeah. was it always was it always your dream to be in football management? Because you're you're fairly young at the moment, aren't you? I am. I just turned 31 that's like three months ago. And there you go. honestly, I have to be honest, it wasn't. It wasn't at all. Uh, I started playing football very, very old, like for what's typical here in Spain. But when I got to my career, to my university career, I just met this coach that he changed my life. He just got me into the passion of coaching. And that's where I knew it was my thing. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So after that, you ended up at Sparsis Academy in New York back in yes. 2017. Now, how was that for you? Because I'm assuming that you're a Barcelona fan. I'm assuming. I'm a huge Barcelona fan, yeah. <laughs> right. So to be part of their academy, especially in New York, big city, what was that for you as an accomplishment? Look, for me, it was amazing because I, I was just like, I think it was two years into coaching. It was all very quick. I hadn't even finished my college career. So I had to quit everything and just change my life from, from, a, from a to Z. So it was amazing. And I was lucky because... Barca works with academies, but also has like, um, like basic uh, youth development. So it's like two very different parts. And we were lucky because our project in New York was to develop a sort of Masia, like the one in Barcelona, but in New York. So it was really into the youth development of the club. It was like officially 100% Barca coach. Uh, it was it was life changing for me, honestly. Well, as far as I'm aware, you were a technical director of some sort, right? I went there as a head coach. And yeah. like, I think it was three, four months in, um, the club had to develop quicker than we expected. And the two technical directors in the moment uh, asked me to uh, upgrade a little bit my, mm -hmm. my function. Uh, just to help them out a little bit and, and became like a methodology coaching uh, technical director, like many of other my, uh, my colleagues also did it. And it was, it was great. Honestly, it was so fast paced, everything. But for me, it was like living a dream. It was an amazing city. My club, it, it was, it was great. Yeah. Well, this is the, this is uh, the thing when it comes to coaching, there are a lot of people that I speak to who, have literally just started coaching and they, they find it very, very difficult to find that first job, not yes. just because of the experience, but also the qualifications. You practically lived a dream by coaching yeah. the club that you support, but also in one of the biggest cities in the world. Yes, 100%. Obviously, that's a phenomenal achievement. But what advice can you give to people that are perhaps starting off and feel that maybe they're a little bit restricted or maybe they won't be able to get the job of their dreams what, what advice would you give them look honestly for me it was i was very lucky very lucky because it was so quick and very early on uh, i met somebody that trusted me and uh, did a bet for me 
and helped me get into these type of jobs. But I always say the same. I think if I wasn't, if I weren't been ready in that moment, if I wasn't, um, if I didn't have my degrees as uh, physical, uh, everything, the college, the coach courses, the coach licenses, everything, you can be lucky, but it's more difficult, you know? If you work it, if you develop yourself, if you learn every day, if you work hard, it's it's the typical, I know it's it's what everyone says, but if when the chance comes, you're not ready, it's not, it's not gonna come, it's not, you're not gonna be able to take it. So, of course I was lucky, but, I also had worked my ass off, honestly, to to be able to take it when I was ready. And I had to leave my family. I had to leave my girlfriend in that moment. I had to leave uh, my job in that moment, my college career. So you you have to be ready to bet for what you like, and you have to be ready to to just give it all for what you like. Absolutely. And as you know, the United States, even now, is still a developing football nation. Obviously, yes. there are some massive clubs out there. As you can see, Atlanta United, you look at their stadium. It's yeah. huge, you know, various clubs. It's, it's amazing. Well, there you go. But looking back on your time in the United States, how would you say the attitude towards football is perceived? Because I'm assuming, I'm assuming there was a big Hispanic influence in the city yeah. and an Italian one as well and possibly a Greek 100%. one. So when it came to coaching players at the academy, what level were they in terms of their age? And on top of that, what about the ability? Did you notice anything different from Spain? Look, the first thing, and I remember very vividly, and I remember it a lot, is that when we got there, you could see that there was a passion growing for football, obviously, because it's not that we got there and they started liking football. They, they did like football many years ago, but they had like this fo American football mentality to always go forward, very physical, very um, quick, all with speed, all with strength. And I remember my main team, the one that I remember the most, our players were basically Hispanic or Croatian, Greek, Italian, these type of European or Latin communities that have more passion for football are the ones that did push more. But after the years, much more American kids started also to get this passion. And, and you can see it now for, for the American uh, youth ages that they're developing a lot of good players that are getting into high divisions right now. But the main thing was this physical, uh, direct, uh, quick, paced. Um, it was like another type of football that we weren't really used to. So you just had to get this physical things and development develop them into the football we understand but also many players came from baseball basketball even american football and even did two three sports so it was quite a weird mix honestly uh, i can imagine mate but at least your sport for choice in terms of the amount of talent there is yeah. you know it, it, it won't be difficult to find players yeah. who want to play you know, I've, I've got friends who live in the United States. One of them in particular, Mark, God bless Mark. He's been out there for many years. He was coaching at Birm Birmingham City and then ended up in the United States. He was at Liverpool's International Academy in Texas. And now he's coaching another club in, in Texas. And he tells me that it's so expensive for kids to play in clubs yes. in, in the United States, regardless of where they are, because they pay for their own kits. They pay for mm -hmm. memberships. Were there a lot of restrictions? And on top of that, were there a lot of kids that perhaps couldn't afford it for whatever reason? Luckily, we went with a club that obviously you don't have to lie about it. It's a club with many resources. It's, it's Barca. It's not, you have many resources for the kids. So in this sense, we were able to provide a little bit more of help for the talented players that you think you have to provide this help. But man, it was crazy. I had kids that did two hours and a half car rides just to come training two hours and a half come, two hours and a half back. So it was like five hours a day in the car just to come for training. Kids that uh, slept in ca big caravans just for the game. It was crazy. But like, it's what we were saying before, the, the passion American people or these type of communities that live in America have for sport is amazing. And that's why, as you said, they won't have problem to develop many kids, many talents, because they just have a big number on which to choose and they have this mentality regards sports that they just 
are really, really competitive. It's just that they need to channel it and develop it uh, properly, but they are doing it. So it's, it's great. Fantastic. And the final question I have about your time in the United States, as you know, in, in every country, the educational system has its own syllabus. So every mm. school or college has to follow this, this syllabus. Yes. With the academy at Barcelona in, in the United States, was there a similar syllabus situation whereby it was using the Barcelona method in the United States? Because I haven't actually asked this question before. I should have asked Mark if Liverpool were doing something similar in, in Texas, but yeah. I guess that was more like a franchise than anything. Whereas, yeah. you know, Barcelona in the United States, did you have to go buy this playbook, the Barcelona playbook, so, so to speak? Yeah, the, the Barcelona methodology, as you can say, a playbook, but the methodology is, is non-negotiable. It's like, it's something that the club has been developing since long years, since Cruyff, since Guardiola, since many coaches. You cannot say them all. But it's it's the identity of the club, the methodology, the style of play. It's something that you know how Barcelona plays. You don't even need to know the coach. You don't even need to know the players. You know their game. So this was non-negotiable there. And at the end, if the idea was to develop players there that could finally come back here and even grow more and potentially be Barca players, you have to teach them the Barca methodology. If not, it, it doesn't make sense. So in that sense, it, it was what I was saying before. It was the most difficult thing was to change their sports mentality, which was very strong, very physical, very, everything was like very athletic because they are like this, to being able to be more patient, to understand the game, to read the game, to be more clever in, on the field. So what you were saying about the playbook was it, it was a huge impact. And I think it was the main contrast we found the first year that obviously it's not easy to go somewhere and change mentalities because it's it's in it's in the DNA. It's it's in somebody. So, yeah, it was like a bit a bit challenging, but the methodology is, is never negotiable. No, that's important. That's important. I yeah. guess it's uh, it's vital to keep the club's DNA and, as you said, the methodology going. Because if you go off track, then you're, you're going to all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You're exactly. Lost. So uh, it's important. And I know you've since coached under 16s and under 18s yes. back in Catalonia. Yeah. In terms of the overall attitude towards the tactical and technical side of football, I know. There are a lot of clubs out there that look at Guardiola and what he did at Barcelona and obviously what he's doing at Manchester City and they yeah. use that as the blueprint to move forward. Yes. Was it a similar attitude at the clubs that you coached at or was it slightly different in the approach to coaching? Look, in here in Spain, luckily, the football has developed a lot. It has grown a lot, but not only in number of players, but also in development of these players you can go now to a town club and you see coaches who are well developed who have knowledge of the game who have knowledge of the methodology training and that's it's just the base for a country to grow in this sense so when you when i came back here it was you obviously have more bases on the players to work on but it's also different in the sense that there's so many level here in spain Honestly, there's so many level in young kids and youth players and in development that there is a part of competition that you cannot just take out of the equation. At the end of the day, if you don't win, you sorry, I'll put it on silent. At the end of the day, if you don't win, your job is not going to last much. And sadly, it's like this. If you train high uh, divisions in youth development, it's like this. So. You have to find that balance between that competition, that winning on on the weekend with that methodology. But of course, it's easier when you have developed players that, that come with very good basis from all the works of our colleagues. Uh, do you know what? I remember going to uh, Malaga about mm. six or seven years ago. Yes. And by the hotel I was staying at, there was a, a football pitch. It was, it was for youth clubs yeah. or I don't know which clubs they were but there were a lot of youngsters yeah. playing there and I'll never forget one evening you've got a game going on I, I can't I don't know if they were just uh, it was the same team and they were playing again because they had bibs on so I'm assuming okay, they yeah, were the same probably. club 
But on the touchline, you had parents sitting there. They had a one had a barbecue going. I couldn't believe it, you know. <laughs> and it's a stark contrast to what I'm used to in the UK, in the sense that yeah, parents are on the touchline, but they're very, oh, they're demanding. They're yelling at mm -hmm. the referees. They, and I've got a friend that again, I keep mentioning him because he, I'm so proud of him. I've got a friend that used to be the chairman of a grassroots club in the UK and they won grassroots team of the year in 2022. Wow, that's and um, you know, big, it, it was phenomenal. And they're a, they're a separate yeah. grassroots club, which is, makes it even wow. more incredible. And, um, you know, he tells me about how some parents of other teams, because his his club never liked that. They always used to tell the parents, either yeah, stay here yeah. and support your kids or, piss off basically yeah but he'd be playing against other clubs and you'd see the parents berating referees all that kind of stuff but i never saw that again maybe it was just uh, me not noticing it but i never saw that in spain so again when it comes to the, the youngsters do the coaches encourage the parents to support them but also just back off and let the coaches do the jobs and let the kids play look you you can never be general about the topic you can never say all of the parents here in Spain, all of the coaches here in Spain, because it's there are so many people that you can just say it. But it's true that I think that in youth uh, development, there is still a long way to grow uh, regarding parents' uh, attitude and parents' behavior. Uh, there, I don't want to make it general, obviously, but there's many, how do I say it? coach parents you know what i mean like coach parents there is many yeah. Yeah. parents that think that they have the next messy and i think it's it's it, honestly it's like that and i don't think that's good for the youth development for the kids or either for the sport because then sadly you get to see in first division uh, very wrong behaviors on the stands uh, that they just come from they just come from down they just come from the base they just come from the roots so it's something that we still have to develop. But obviously, I don't want to make it general. There's amazing parents. And I had the luck that to train teams that with amazing group of parents when it was going well and when it was going bad because I've had bad luck also with teams. And in this sense, I've been lucky. I think it's the general thinking you're in Spain. But there's still a march to grow or a point to grow. I can imagine. I can imagine. Yeah. So you've then... Ended up at Bafo in yes. 2022, and you were yeah. involved in the academy. Yep. First of all, how did you end up at Bafo? Because I know David Badia was at Agrida via yes. Ethnic God and Ayak. And, yeah. Yes. So how did your move to Bafo come about? Because I can't remember there being anyone at Bafo that was that so, was Spanish uh, at the time. There was. There was. There was. There was. The methodology... The, sorry. The director of the academy was Mark Velasco. He was ah. my uh, director in uh, USA, in New York. So it was what I was saying before. It's about being lucky about the connections you make. But obviously, if when I was, if when I was working in the USA, I did a bad job or I behaved bad or whatever, Mark would have never called me to come to Buffalo. So Again, this connection, yes, of course, you have to be lucky. And, and honestly, I've been lucky and I owe Mark so much. But you have to earn it also and you have to perform also because we were many coaches in 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 USA. And I don't know, he called me, maybe he called other ones and said, no, I don't know. But you have to you have to be ready to take it. So Mark was the one that took me to Buffalo's uh, academy. Well, the thing is, I, I agree 100% about the working the working hard quote that you just uh, yeah. gave me because, you know, I skipped a few clubs from the time that you, from Barcelona to Buffalo. It was about three or four clubs. So yes. it's not as if you went from Barcelona straight to Buffalo. No, you, you, did the, you did the graft. Yeah. You did the, the hard yards, as they say. You yes. did the under-16s, the under-18s, et cetera, et cetera, which, which yes. got you to where you are, deservedly so. In terms of... Your, your role, director of methodology. Yes. How would you, okay, this isn't like a job interview thing, but how would you describe the role? What were your main responsibilities? Look, in, in Buffos, uh, we all know the facilities they have, the amount of help they have from the owners, which are investing a lot in the club and doing it really well. But 
there was a really nice project on on the academy really really nice project my job with mark was just to like a little bit like in the usa but for me not as tough honestly because cypriot have this european football mentality but just to give this channel just to put the cypriots a uh, little kids or youngsters this extra that they need um, in order to finally develop uh, in more modern football or in more, let's say, more competitive football. So they they just don't uh, develop for Cypriot football. They develop for European football, for top leagues football, because there is the quality. There is not many people in Cyprus. It's, it's like that small island, but there is the quality there. So my main role was to develop the coaches so they can develop the players. Because I was saying before, in the little kids, if you don't develop the coaches, the kid will never grow. Honestly, it's like that. You can have an amazing player. If you don't teach him well, he has to be absolutely amazing to make it. If not, you don't make it. You have to have a good guidance. So I think that was our main role, to give the little kids this new training methodologies, techniques, to just make them a little bit more adaptive, a little bit more clever, to say it that way, on the field, because they have the roots, they have the basis, they have the good technique, the good physical uh, aspects, just this extra touch in, in the sense of reading and understanding the game. So what's the youngest age group that you uh, worked alongside? Because I, I don't know the, the buffer system fully. I know there's an under-13s because they beat Real Madrid in the Dubai, in this tournament in yes. Dubai. So they beat the yes. 2 0 yeah. Um, so what was the youngest age group that you were working with? Do you remember? I came in Paphos for the under 17s, but like a week after, I also started coaching the under 16s because there was some intern changes. And I was here. I I love my job and they offered me to get both teams. I could manage it for for schedule meaning. So I just developed both teams. And yeah, uh, the youngest here in Paphos was under 16s. Okay, that, that's interesting because, as you know, there's there's only a few clubs in Cyprus that are really fully focused on youth yes. development. And, you know, I'm not just saying this, but my team, Ormonia, I think we're clear mm -hmm. at the moment mm -hmm. when it comes yeah. to youth development. So in terms of the, the, the buffer, I'd say, strategy, would you say that their aim was to not just over not overpower but overtake Omonia but also be the leading club where every child wants to be or every parent wants their child to be because we're seeing that right now there's only a couple of clubs where parents really want their kids to thrive at look honestly and I know I'm I'm biased I don't I think you say no, that it's all good man I, I ain't taking yeah. it that way it's fine <laughs> look <laughs> it's it's just that you go to Paphos you see it's an amazing city with uh, it's very peaceful, it's very kind people, it's very nice city. But focusing on the football club, those facilities, like, honestly, you don't find them in many places. And this season when we left, uh, they were finishing three football fields uh, with paddle court, with a beach soccer court, with a small 5 to 5 court, with an amazing gym, with amazing um, uh, dressing rooms, uh, offices for the coaches with big screens just you have everything you have everything to develop the players and i don't know if if the main role is to overcome Omonia or apoel or but it is to be a top uh, club in cyprus and they are working for it they are working for it in facilities in in also investment and also in in human being um, workers because they are developing a lot they have technical directors, age uh, directors, they have coaches, they have assistant coaches, physical trainers, physios, goalkeeper coaches. That's that's investing on the kid because honestly it's investing on the kid. You don't you don't win money from that. It's it's how it is. So to be able to be part of that and to be able as a parent or as a kid to be able to be part of that and be able to work day by day in those facilities. I think it's something that every kid in, in in Cyprus should should aim at. And I know there's other clubs that have amazing facilities. Honestly, I've had the pleasure to to play in them. But I think Paphos, in this sense, is working a little bit 
to be a little bit above other other clubs in this sense. I, I do believe that. Well, it's understandable because clearly, as you quite rightly said, they're investing to be yeah. the best. There's no two yes. ways about it. And the thing is, when, when people say to me, oh, you know, you can't compare the clubs, yada, yada, yada. Okay, I understand you can't really compare Omoni to Buffalo now because Omoni has got the history, yeah. they've got the heritage, et cetera, yes. et cetera. But I'm pretty certain that from a statistical standpoint, based on players produced that play in the first team, either sold on or yeah. are still at the club, that is a factor that many clubs look at, especially when it comes to youth development, because you don't want to just produce a player and exactly. then by the age of 16, they're at the door. You want them to progress. You want them to be yes. a, a first teamer. And look, let's get it right. A lot of clubs in Cyprus want to produce players to sell them on. It's just fact because, yeah. because of the, the quality of the league. Yeah. In this sense, look, what they did uh, last year with the under-19 and Paphos, of course, yes, you, you bring players from, from abroad. If you want to have a, a big achievement, you need that extra help because it's like that. Let's let's just be honest. Uh, you can't compete in the sense of Paphos is not a big city like Nicosia or Larnaca or Limassol. So you can't compete in that sense. But there were good Cypriot players in that team, and they're doing the preseason now with the, the first team. I'm, I'm looking at the uh, social media of the club every day, and you see Lisandros, you see many players there. And those are Cypriot players that come out from the academy, and you have to be very proud of that. And of course, then you never know what will happen. Maybe you have to sell them, maybe they become your superstar, maybe they, they can't get to play football. You never know. But the work is there, and if you work there, you have more probabilities, you have more chances just to to achieve what you want, that is to produce players for your first team. For sure, absolutely. And, you know, your next role was at Agrida as, as an, anal an analyst. I can never yes. get that word right. Um, and that in itself, like when people say analyst, what, what does it mean? There's a lot of statistics. <laughs> There's a lot of yes. factors involved in the role. Yes. And it isn't just sitting there watching one no. video clip. You're looking at, players and especially if they've got the gps trackers on them mm -hmm. you're looking at everything heart rates to you name it and it's it's a massive job so you've gone to agrida a newly promoted side i'm guessing the main aim was to avoid relegation i'm yes, guessing sure. anyway but you're playing on on the first day of the season right <laughs> Yes, I know. You know what happened, right? With that game, I know what happened. Yeah, <laughs> you know I what remember very good well that day, <laughs> mate. I, I it's just like what that was one of the luckiest goals I've ever seen in my life. But I'm not going to go into that, True. right? But you know, you, you've gone to the club, and clearly there's there's ambitions there. So yes. I don't think you would have just gone there for the sake of it. That club has mm. ambitions; they still do, even though they're in the second division. Yeah. Um, but you've you've gone in there, and you're thinking newly promoted club coming from Buffer who are challenging for for titles and honours to a club yeah. that's different kind of yeah. strategy or, or aims. What was that like for you going in as the, the analyst? What was the first thing that you're thinking when you've walked into the club? Look, for me, it was a huge honour. First thing, because you, as a coach, you always want to be in the top, as to say it that way. And yes, you go from Paphos that is fighting for everything to Akritas that is a newly promoted club. First time in history, they're in first division, big achievement. But still, you're going to first division. First division in Cyprus, uh, man, people abroad don't know it, but it's a huge league. It's a huge competition. It's huge level. And it's with amazing stadiums, with uh, good crowds, with everything. So for me, it was a big honor. In that sense of my work, uh, I was lucky that, for example, everything you said before, we had very good physical coaches that helped a lot with the GPSs, with the data and that. But still, in, in, in your own way, you get to live day by day with professional players, with players that have had a good career and players that are going to have a great career also. And you get to work there day by day. It's, it's, it's a huge honor. And then I think we started developing a team that was very young, very ambitious, very brave with the ball. Maybe too brave with the ball because in many games we had those little mistakes that that are part of the game, honestly. And it's just, it's just the, the you, you, you throw a coin and sometimes it go head and sometimes it goes tails. I remember in Nea Salamina's second game, I think it was, or third game, uh, the first goal we concede is a bad pass from our center back, they, or bad control. 
and they just scored the first goal and then in the 90, 95th they score uh, from a corner it's football mate it's football you lose 2-1 and you go home that's it but that development that uh, style of play that uh, age group because we were i think the third youngest team in the whole europe so it is an ambitious project and for me it was it was amazing to be part of it mate do you know i, I seem to remember on this pod I can't remember what, what stage of the season it was. I think it was round about when the playoffs started. Then I think you drew two consecutive games. Was it Paralimni and then Ael? I can't remember. I think it was uh, Paralimni. It was and Ael, Ael. And, Ael and Aris. Ael and Aris, yeah. yeah. Uh, before, well, in, in, the, in the playoffs? In the, no, the, the, releg the, the relegation playoffs. Oh, the you mean in playoffs. the playoffs. Yeah, we started with yeah. two draws, yeah. I think. Yeah. But That's before the playoffs, we we read, we draw with Ael and then Aris or Aris and then Ael. I don't remember honestly. Yeah, you drew you drew new new at Aris yes. and you drew with Ayek away. Yes, exactly. And that yes. that Ayek game, I thought, what are they playing at Ayek? Because I know they had the European game, so they they played yeah. a few fringe players or beat it. But I think they disrespected you guys because you guys were fighting for survival. And for, I understand that they wanted to preserve preserve their players for European football, but yeah, you know, you're a team fighting for relegation at the time and you can't yes. be doing that kind of stuff. And they were lucky to score in the last couple of minutes, wasn't it? It was in the 80-something, yeah, from a yeah. pass inside the box. We didn't defend really well. But I think in that, in that sort of games, the team, look, the team grew a lot and we knew yeah. the team would grow a lot from the beginning to the end of the season. We had very young players uh, that needed that experience in first division, that needed that experience in high competitive leagues. And we, yeah. we knew that the, the team would go up. The process was difficult. It wasn't easy. There was a phase of the league that we had too many uh, losses in a row. But the team fi finally competed very well. And I think mm -hmm. the, the final playoffs uh, proves it. Uh, we had amazing games against the big teams, like the draw against Stadis that, honestly, I think we could have won. The draw against Tyke that we could have lost also, but I remember they don't concede the second the second goal from VAR. Yeah, uh, I'm biased, but for me it was goal. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> <laughs> so you're there, you're fighting, you're developing those players, you're making them grow, you're making them be more competitive. They are making it also, of course. It's it's their effort, and I think we proved we can compete. Everyone, we had several bad games, obviously, but. Man, it's part of the development. It's part of the project. We knew what the project was. Yeah. What I found uh, really entertaining about Agrida, they were never a team to sit back and defend. No. You know, they always they always went for it. And obviously, there, there were some heavy defeats. You know, there's the 4-0 yes. against Buffalo. There's a 5-2 against Buffalo. There's another 4-0 here and there. But, you know, yes. you beat my team, Omonia. You yes. just about lost to my team if it weren't for yeah. Bezos scoring in the last minute. Bezos at, at the buzzer, as we call it. Yeah. Um, I think you lost 2 1 at home to Upwell. So, again, uh, there were a few close games. Yeah. So, th th there was a lot of close games. But, you know, in the playoffs, or should I say the relegation playoffs, it's almost as if that you guys came to life because I remember you, you beat Anorthosi twice. Yes. Uh, you beat Salamina. You beat Doxa. You beat. Yes. Who else? Who else? Uh, you beat Bael, Bael also at home. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and to be honest, man, like you mentioned the, the youth at that squad and, and the youngsters. You, you had um, uh, you had Juninho. You had yeah. Arajo. They had. Uh, who else? Uh, Ra yeah. yeah. Ramirez, the Brazilian. The Brazilian Ramirez, striker. and I was in, in Latvia. And we had many young players. We had Guy as uh, also young players. Tone, the midfielder. More experience, but we had many, many young players. We had Hamed, Balta, and he got injured in, from uh, from knee injury and lost all the yep. season, but he was an amazing uh, young centre-back. We had many players, and obviously then we had that experience that you also need in, in these type of teams because, because you need it, because you need that uh, guidance, you need that patience, you need that calmness. And you had players like Abra, you had players like Javi, you had these type of players that have, have amazing careers that give you that sense of pause and yeah. tempo in the locker room. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned Javi Arasso. What yeah. a player he is. Like amazing. Uh, 30, amazing. 30, 32, 33 years old. 32, what a baller. Years old. Yeah. Look, uh, I'm out of words for him. Uh, he's, I think, one of the cleverest players I've ever met. 
he reads the game amazingly he understands the game amazingly and then he has good box occupation he ended up scoring six or seven goals i think yep. uh, he has physical development for and um, deployment sorry for his age he can run a lot and he just he's well it proves why he's played where he's played the same with abra and the same with these type of players that have had great careers it's it's not me who has to talk about them they've talked about themselves yeah. more than enough of course well that's it well, there's one player who i really really like that uh, and I'm not singling him out, but um, the the, the oh, for crying out loud, I forgot his bloody name. Now. His, his name was in my head a second ago. I just had it. Vasco Lopez. Vasco Lopez. Yes. Sorry. Yes. I just, it, for some reason, the names just disappear out of my mouth. Uh, Vasco <laughs> Lopez. He was a January signing, if I'm not mistaken. He was a January um, signing, yes. And he came in, and I think, I think, did he score against Anorthosi at home? He came in, he scores against Anorthosi, the winning goal. Yeah. He scores against. I'll I no, he misses the the rebound we score from his 1v1. No, he gave us a lot. He amazing player. Uh, I think honestly, for me, one of the best 1v1s of the league by far. Like for sure. He was that type of player that was able to dribble one, two, three players, uh, very aggressive with the ball, very brave with the ball. Uh, he helped us a lot, honestly, a lot. So in in terms of you look at the squad, a lot of them, as you mentioned, were, were quite young. So yeah. would you think the aim of the club was to get these developed and move them on um, later on? Because as far as I'm aware, a lot of them are still at the club for next season. Look, honestly, um, I don't know what will happen this season with these players, honestly, because mm. I really don't know. But there was a big goal of trying to stay in the league with young players where you could develop them with more experience than stay a couple of years in the league with these still young players, but with more experience. And obviously you are a club that is first time in history that you're in first division. You need also that type of investment. If you get a couple or three good sells, man, that's part of football. Also, if you have that piece in your budget, the uh, things go better, but yeah, the development of, of players was one of the main aim of, of Akritas, for sure. That's why we had the squad we had. Well, as I said, the, the club showed absolutely no fear. Yeah. Absolutely no fear. And and no I think that's, that's admirable, in all fairness. But next season in Division 2, it's, it's going to be even more of a challenge, not just because they are going to be players coming and going. You yeah. look at the other clubs in Division 2 at the moment, if you look at Bayer, who've got Jason Punch in yeah. his head coach, I'm sure he's going to bring in his players. Or Monia Gosienya, you've got obviously Baralimni, other clubs yeah. as well, Map. So it, it's certainly going to be a, a challenging season. But I think the structure's there. I think the structure is there and the scouting system is yeah. there as always is important. I think it is, honestly. I think it's a club that in their type of way and in, in their type of investment, to say it that way, in trying to bring young players and having this model of club that it's it's very valid i think it's a club that's doing things very well it's it's being as you said very brave which is not easy which also helps develop the separate football that we have to keep in mind that it's also very important so yeah in this sense it, it won't be easy because second division is not an easy division uh, you always have these four or five teams uh, that are very good that want to promote that have good investments also because we had teams in second division this year that have promoted that had really good investments also it's it's like that and it's a tough uh, division for young players but at the end they did it once they promoted it with young players and i think if you have a clear idea if you have a clear line of 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 what you want as a club you just have to follow it whatever happens uh, keep working on it try to develop it as as better as possible, as well as possible. And it will give you results uh, sooner or later. And they've had them. So just keep sticking to that. Keep working. They have, a, as you said, an amazing scouting system. And and that's also part of the big work they're doing. Absolutely. And one more question about the playing staff. There was a winger on loan at the club, Gavril. The, some of the goals that he scored last season, mate, I'll tell you, he, he had no right 
no right to do that. <laughs> but um, what can well, you tell us about him? Because I know he's, he's back on, well, back at Abuel. I don't know yes. whether he's going to go out on loan again, but 21 years old. He's a talent, isn't he? Look, for me, Stavros or Gabriel is the clear example of Cypriot football. It's that example of amazing technique you have in Cypriot because you have players with amazing technique, with amazing physical skills because he was a guy that was quick in short spaces with very dynamic moves. And that's also very good. And I could see it also in, in youth categories in youth division, sorry. But he has that mentality that I think in some points in Cypriot development lacks. Stavros is a guy that doesn't think uh, I want to, he loves Apoel. Honestly, he's a big fan of Apoel. He's developed there and he's now playing for them. And I think it's his dream. But he looks at the bigger picture. He looks at what he wants. He, he wants to play big. He wants to develop. He wants to be in top leagues. He wants, to, he wants everything. And I think in Cyprus sometimes, and I don't want to seem disrespectful, I'm not, but sometimes players think that reaching the, the Cyprus national team is enough. And I think it's not enough. It's not enough. You have quality to, to go to top leagues. You have quality to go abroad to bigger leagues and also to make Cypriot League grow. So Stavros is, is that example. He was a guy that he came on loan. He was respectful. He was working. Uh, he just gave it all for the team. He had difficult situations inside the, the team, which he managed to solve them very well with good work, with ambition. And obviously he has the basis. He has amazing technique. And so... For me, I'm very happy that he's doing the preseason with Apoel. He's an amazing guy, and I, I know he'll he'll achieve whatever he puts his mind to because because he can. He has everything. He he can, of course. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I, I remember. I think it was against Loxa. Was it the goal against Loxa where he put it in the top corner? Top corner, he's, top four corner. <laughs> yeah, he did like two on. or three of those. He did like uh, not even disgusting. one. No, amazing. Disgusting. Yeah, and he could play as a ten. He could play as a winger. He could. We put him even as left back. He never complained. He just played <laughs> like no top, top, top ambition, top mentality. That's what, that's great. What do you think his best position is, though? Looking at him objectively, uh, look for me, he's a player that if he develops some little aspects, he can be an amazing ten. Yeah. But but when he plays as a winger, that little touch inside for that cross or for that shot to the far post. It's natural to him. It's like he's been doing it all his life and yeah. it, it just clicks on him. You know, he doesn't even have to think about it. He just does it. So that obviously it's a big point. But I think from this number 10 position, if he learns how to receive in those positions, also in the pockets, we say, in between the lines, turn and also face this last pass or last shot, he has amazing quality in there. He's he's good with the ball. He has great control in, in, small, in small spaces. I like him very much as a 10, and he reads the game very well. He's developed a lot in this. But obviously, you put him as a winger, and he scores those goals like every two weeks. Yeah. What can I say? <laughs> Man, this this is it. <laughs> this is it. And, and you know, I don't mean to sound disrespectful to the Cypriot League, because I, I don't mean this, but I've been saying this for as long as I can remember with this podcast. When players in Cyprus reach a certain age, they need to get out and explore other leagues. right? And I'm sorry to say this, because... They will develop in Cyprus, don't get me wrong. But I'll give you an example. Marino Johnny, he's now in MLS. Okay. He got out to Cy he got he left Cyprus at the right time, as far as I'm concerned. Someone like Gavriel, as much as I don't like the club that he plays for, you've got to show them the respect for producing him. But yeah. if he wants to take it that next level, people like him, like Hamboa Almonia, like Loiso, like various other players, various other youngsters, yes. they need to leave this league. Because there's no way that they'll be able to perform on a big stage regularly if they stay in Cyprus. It's just a fact of life. Cyprus is yeah. never going to be Premier League. It's never going to be Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Never. But we need to face facts. If these lads want to progress, they need to move elsewhere. And again, sorry to cut you off on this one, but mm -hmm. we know with the national team, you, you have to perform at a certain level to get there. And I'll be honest with you, apart from maybe Loizu as a right winger, I can't think of anyone else challenging him for that position. So if Gavril wants to be serious for that yeah. position, either you make it up well or you go elsewhere to do it. Yeah, I agree. But 
also this comes a little bit from from below you know what i mean it comes a little bit also from the developing system you have here and they have there in cyprus and then there is also a very important fact apart from the mentality that i think it's something that slowly it's changing apart from this mentality to wanting to look higher like aim bigger there's also one thing in cyprus that i think limits a lot of players and it's part of the country and i'm not going to argue with that but you have one year of military service that just cuts your performance like drastically like you're 18 and you're in your top point of performance you're developing you have that chance to go next extra step and you have to cut one ear for the military service i know there are some players that they have like that paper that don't have to do it but i think it's four or five only for club it's not good enough and i understand there's bigger meanings for the country and i respect that 100 percent humbly it's nonsense it. It's but nonsense. For, I'm sorry. It's nonsense. It shouldn't be done. Wise, yes. For the football wise, yes, hundred percent. It shouldn't be done. And I'll tell you what, there there are some players that I know who not only are they doing their military service and playing, they're also studying. Yes. They're also at college. Yes. So th- th- your where does your development where how does it happen? It stops. How? It stops. It stops. Hundred percent. It stops. Okay, maybe it doesn't stop, but it's it stops growing, you know, let's yeah. say it that way. It's much more difficult to develop like that. And we face that problem in the academy and it's very difficult to deal with. You have players that come to the training very tired, um, late, or they have to go quick or they and they haven't slept in all night and things like that, which I understand is part of the military service and I understand that. But for the football development and also I think for the study development also it's I don't think it's good, but hey, who am I to say how you have to of course. Uh, move of course. your country, you know? But, but uh, for I, the football, I understand, but I understand, but let, let's let's get it right. I mean, I look, I, I don't want to delve into it deeper than what we've already done, but the fact is, you know, this isn't the 30s. It, conscription doesn't really doesn't really exist, and it shouldn't. And that's how it just mm-hmm. seems, that they, they, they have to do it. But for me, okay, I understand the discipline side, and I understand it... It makes you more of a man if you're in the army, whatever that means these days. But I just, I just think that, you know, when you're, when you're a player, and this goes back to what I said about leaving when you can. If you're 16, 17, get out because go to Sweden, go to Denmark, go to yes. a, another country where you can develop. Because, you know, there's a couple, in fact, there's three, three or four players now that are in academies in Cyprus and they're now doing... Um, courses in the united states what do they call them um oh my god i forgot what they're called now they're doing uh, university courses in the united okay. states so they're playing okay. football out there college football but also studying one okay. of them is a uh, sava from ammonia they've gone out there to do um you know whatever to boost their yeah. education yeah, yeah, yeah. so may- maybe that's the only way out and i think it's, it's ridiculous that the cypriot cypriot are doing this but the cypriot do a lot of things that i don't agree with and that don't make sense in my head, but I'm in the UK, so obviously I don't have yeah. an opinion on these. But anyway, it is what it is. Well, look, um, on, on a final note, and I know Thasso isn't here to ask the question, so I'll ask it on his behalf. Akoso Nodi, the goalkeeper. Yes. Yeah. Thasso is a big Aston Villa fan, and on- Onodi was okay. at Aston Villa. Yes. I and he, he was a little bit upset that Onodi didn't get any games for Agrida last season. <laughs> and this was an ongoing thing that Thassel was saying, why isn't he playing? Why isn't he playing? We spoke to David Badia about this and David yes. obviously gave us his opinion and whatever. But in terms of a goalkeeper, what was keeping him out? Was Bendreo really that good in that respect that he you couldn't displace him or was it just that Onodi was just unlucky? Uh, I think when a player gets to not play in the full season, there's many factors. Obviously, maybe it's a question that would be better for the goalkeeper coach. I'm putting him out there. Of course, I'll get him on. I'll ask him one day. I'll ask him one day. I'll find him. (laughs) But um, honestly, and now I'm being 100% honest, we had three very good goalkeepers because Guy was amazing. Clayton was amazing. Akos was really good, honestly. And he has the size. He has the, the big arms that you need as a goalkeeper. But I think he had many factors of call it bad luck, call it bad timing, call it whatever. He also had a couple injuries in, in training. I remember he had a, a, a shot to his face. He had like a severe um, a concussion, severe injury, a severe concussion. He was like maybe a month out. So 
he did have this bad luck also. But in the moment, maybe that Clayton had a little bit, not say a bad performance because it wasn't really bad performance, but you could think maybe we can give opportunities. Maybe in that point, D was just more prepared. I'm not going to say better because the word isn't better. It's just more prepared, more ready. It's, I don't know how to say it, honestly, but he was a player that had a goalkeeper, sorry, that had really good communication. You can tell he he had many years in, in the UK because he had that, that strong communication, that good uh, demanding from behind. He had really nice things and he was like very quick with, with reactions. But sometimes it's, it just happens. We had many players that had, that had that same situation uh, that didn't have maybe the minutes that they could have had, but for several reasons, they, they just didn't have it. It's, it's part of a football team, I think. But uh, yeah, he can be angry because he didn't play, but playing the goalkeeper coach. <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. But look, he's 21 years old, so he's got yeah. plenty of years ahead of him as a goalkeeper. And, and he'll, he'll have an amazing years. career. Yeah, easily. He'll have an amazing career. He's a professional guy. He works. He's a good guy. You can talk to him. He's never had a bad word. Mm -hmm. He hasn't played in the whole season. He's never had a bad face. Obviously, he wanted to play, but never with disrespect. Never. I I'm very happy with him. We have good relationship and I'm sure he'll have an amazing career for sure, hundred percent. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I know. Thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you on thank this you podcast. Guys. Hopefully, we can do something in the near future. And good luck to you for whatever you decide to do this year and moving on mm -hmm. to next season. Um, boys much. and girls, thank you for viewing. Thank you for watching, tuning in. Don't forget to like, subscribe, visit our Discord. All the socials are in the description at, at the bottom. I'm putting Anal's one in there as well. So you can give him a follow on Instagram because that's where I found him. So <laughs> that's it for another episode of This Is My Pass. Until next time, adios.